We have the freedom to celebrate, and we want to do that with full enthusiasm on behalf of those who don't have that freedom. Amen. And it's a very important assignment that we have, so I thank you for that. There's still a few mugs left. If you got somebody you want a mug? In a Jesus-loving, God-honoring sort of way, with a coffee cup. No violence as an invitation to Easter. But those mugs are still out in the lobby. Please take all that you would like as long as you're sharing them. We'll make them available for you after Easter, I promise, okay? We have some children in the room tonight. The students are busy down the hall. They are preparing the Easter bags with communion and sermon outlines and all those good things. They are busy down there. In fact, we're going to join them in just a minute. We're going to peek in on them with the cameras, I think. So, But for our offertory prayer, I want to pray for the children. If we've got children and students in the room, we're going to let you stand up. Will you do that? If you're not sure, somebody help them. <laughs> All right. Come on. I'm not going to make you talk. But I do think you ought to come sit on the steps with me. Can you do that? Can you come sit on the steps with me? We're going to pray. Come on. Look, they can climb those steps so easy back there. Come on, you just sit up here with me. It's okay. Wednesday's a bath day, so it's safe to sit next to me. Okay. What's up? Hey, dude. This is a good looking crew. You know, as a matter of habit, we minister to well more than a thousand children and students a week, just in the routine of what we do around here. And many weeks, it's twice that number. And that's possible because of the time and effort you invest in their lives. Um, they're not the future of the church. They're the church now. Amen. See, which one of these is not like the others? <laughs> I think I'm going to lose out on that. But, you know, statistically, it's highly improbable that you'll ever come to faith if you don't do it by the time you're 14. And so the ministry that takes place in the lives of this group of people is essential to our purpose as a congregation. I tell the people who work with children and students that I entertain the people have no, who have no intention of changing so they can minister to those who will. Now, you all are proving me wrong, and I very much appreciate that. But statistically, their lives are incredibly significant. So let's pray that this Easter, the children and the students in this place, but across our nation and around the world, We'll have a revelation of Jesus. Can we do that? Amen. You can stand with me for that prayer. If you're at home, you stand with us. We're going to sit right here because we look really good. Hi. Hi. Father, I thank you for these young people. I thank you for their lives and your great love for them. Lord, we thank you for the honor we have of serving you together and standing together. I thank you for parents and families that invest time and energy in seeing their, these young people have the privilege of come to church. Lord, I pray that as we celebrate Easter, that you would do something beyond any programming we could put together or any class we could prepare. Give them a revelation of yourself. May they know you and understand you in a way that will shape all the days ahead of them. We lift them before you. Lord, I ask for a special blessing upon their lives, upon their homes and their families. We pray for the children, Lord, across our community, across our nation, and around the earth, that this holy week, as we prepare for Easter, that by your spirit, you would move in their lives. Lord, in those places where they have great pressures and they have small resources, encourage them and strengthen them. Those of us who live with abundant blessings, Father, give us grateful hearts, understanding hearts. And I pray for all those who invest time and energy in the well-being of our children. May they have wisdom from you, strength from you. And I pray for those who would do them harm, that they will fail. I thank you for it. Lord, we bless them tonight. In Jesus' name.
Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you all. You can go back to your seats, okay? I'm just going to stay here. No, I can't do that. That was my favorite part of church. <clears throat> we do have teenagers in, <clears throat> I think, Genesis and all nations, junior high and senior high. If you don't have students in those ranges, you could miss that. But every Wednesday night there are on campus, hundreds of them. And tonight they're helping be a part of the Easter preparation. And I think we've got cameras over there. Is that right, Nick? Can we take a peek into Genesis? There we go. Hey, Genesis. Come on, they can hear us, but we can't hear them. So let them hear your applause, huh? Come on. That's God's sweatshop right there. <laughs> And there's another crew over in All Nations. Here we go. Come on. Thank you. Yeah, you see, you won't catch me flexing for the camera when it comes on <laughs> for some very obvious reasons, but it's amazing. If you don't happen to have family members in those age ranges, you can miss it, but... There are remarkable things every week happening in the lives of children and students around this place. And it comes through the lives of the people who give their time and energy in such a beautiful way. So we thank you for that. We thank you for that. All right, did you get an outline when you came in? I want to take, this is a sermonette. I know some of you came to church tonight because you were counting on that. I forgive you. But we want to pray for you. This service is really uh, an extension of something that began years ago when we were at Murphy Center for Easter. And we were just doing one service at the time on Sunday morning. And everybody who helped serve with children and bus host and all the places, they didn't get to go to Easter service. So we started on Saturday night when we got done with all the work of turning a, an athletic center into a worship space. We would have a dress rehearsal for church and invite all the volunteers. So we'd work all day. We'd be nasty by the time we got, we didn't have time to go home and change. So we'd be in our shorts and dirty t-shirts and nobody wanted to stand very close to one another. <laughs> but we would have an Easter service with all the people who were going to serve the next morning. And then through the years we've added services and there have been many additions and varieties on how we've been able to celebrate Easter. But this is kind of the extension of that. We've invited all the people who are a part of the ministry team this weekend that aren't ministering tonight to join us because we want to pray for you and minister to you before we go. You know, we can plan and organize and structure, but we count on an outcome that is more than planning and organization. Only God can change a life. Only God can bring freedom or deliverance or healing or conviction or extend forgiveness. All of those things come from God. And so we have the habit on a very regular basis of standing up and advertising a product that we can't deliver. That's true. If you imagine that serving the Lord is conducting a Bible study where you hold all the facts and you teach the ignorant, you have missed the point. We come with whatever awareness of the Lord he gives us and we invite other people into the transformation that we're experiencing. Amen. And to, to keep that alive and meaningful requires us to understand we are dependent upon the Lord's help. Amen. And so what we gather tonight to do is to present ourselves to the Lord and say, we will serve in your name. We'll present ourselves front and center through the opportunities of this weekend. But then we ask you to do something through our simple little efforts far beyond anything that we could replicate. We'll be hands and feet. We'll be a smile. We'll provide directions. We'll help a child. We'll, whatever that may be, we'll help park cars. But we ask you to bring transformation to the lives that we interact with and those that we don't. So that when the initiative is complete, we can see that without question, God moved in our midst. And I think without any question, the most important part of the weekend is what happens in those of us who serve. Because we, get, we have the experience of offering ourselves 
of investing time and energy and effort, and the dirty little secret of ministry is that it's work. Ministry is a four-letter word. Do the math. <laughs> but to, to ask God to do something, and we're the ones who, who, who walk away going, wow. That was more than we could have done. There were things that happened that we couldn't have, have caused to happen. And then we're stronger. So the next time the opportunity presents itself, prayerfully, we have enough memory that we not only raise our hands, we pull in a friend because we want them to have the experience that we had. See, this notion that church is a spectator sport and we come and we watch and evaluate music and sermons and childcare and facilities is nonsense. We're the church. We're the expression of Jesus Christ in the world in this season. Awkward, but it's through our brokenness and our inconsistencies that the grace of God can be made evident. Amen. That's right. And so an opportunity like this weekend is, is very important for the life of a congregation, ours or any congregation that will dare to raise their hands and say, we'll do more than preach an Easter sermon. Because we learn how to stand together and grow together and and learn together and help one another together. And those are invaluable lessons that only come from experience. They're not theoretical any longer. We haven't been asked, as Peter and John were, to stand in front of people who have or orchestrated the execution of people of faith. We haven't yet been asked to stand in those places and be threatened, to be tortured. But we have been asked to offer ourselves so that through our simple acts of obedience and kindness, others can see the love of God. Amen. And so in all sincerity, thank you. I want to do a bit of a Bible study because I'm asked pretty frequently, you know, why, why is Easter, why is such a big deal? I've done a number of interviews around that lately. And that, that's really what I want to talk to you about, this notion of holidays, because holidays are a big deal. If you work in HR, you talk to, if you're involved in any hiring, one of the first questions everybody asks is, you know, how many holidays do we get? Now, we've changed the language on that a little bit. You know, their personal days or whatever is the currently in vogue, but the real root of that is, you know, how many holidays am I going to get? Well, I want you, I don't want to lose this, that holidays is, is really a, a mashup of holy days. You know, if you live in an agrarian, agricultural world, holidays are kind of one of those mythical things because the animals don't take a day off. Anybody ever here work like, take care of livestock, milk cows, feed the animals? You can't call in sick. They don't care. And, and the pattern that we are still following emerged from that world. We've lost complete sight of the responsibilities that came with the simpler life. The simpler life may have had a slower pace, but the responsibilities were unyielding. So the idea of holidays really emerged from this notion of holy days. The breaks in routine came not for a spring or a fall break, the breaks in routine came to observe holy days. And those holy days became holidays because we got a break from our routines. Now, it's not something new. It goes all the way in our Bibles back to the book of Exodus. And I want to give you just a little bit of historical context. I'm not going to dwell on it for long. But I want you to understand the, the root of what helped us to get to where we are now. Because if we understand that, I think we can make some course corrections that will make us people of stronger faith today. We've lost a little bit. You know, they are celebrating the fact that we're in a post-Christian culture. They love to say that. They love to publish the statistics, easy for me to say. They like to publish the numbers that fewer people are participating in church than ever before. Because they're, they're, in a, they're very anxious to be able to sound the alarm that church is irrelevant. Folks, participation in church is one thing. God's not irrelevant. And they will not eliminate him. <laughs> Lenin didn't eliminate him. Stalin didn't eliminate him. Castro didn't eliminate him. There have been a whole lot of petty dictators that thought they could eliminate God. There have been philosophers. 
been many people attempt, and God has persisted. The empires have come and gone. And God's engagement with humanity persists. So if we go all the way back to Exodus chapter 12, the, we're stepping into the narrative when the people, the Hebrews are still slaves in Egypt. And they've been there for 400 years. They've never been free. It was an extended family that went to Egypt. And they flourished to the point that ultimately they were enslaved. And for hundreds of years, they've been slaves. They've never been autonomous. They've never had a central government. They've never had a capital city. Their identity is they are slaves of Egypt. And one day, this scruffy guy comes in off the shepherd named Moses. And he says, we're leaving. There's no way. They have no army. They have no political clout. They certainly don't have the resources to purchase freedom. And Moses says, never mind, we're leaving. And you know the narrative. We learned from Cecil B. DeMille or Disney someplace. The T Ten Commandments or the Prince of Egypt. You've seen the story. And the culmination of that, after all the plagues and Pharaoh's heart is still hardened, is the last night there in Egypt, death comes to the land. And the instruction that's been given through Moses to the Hebrew slaves is to take a lamb and to capture the, to, to slaughter the lamb, capture the blood in a basin, and with a local weed, put the blood on the doorpost of the house. And during that night, death is coming to the land of Egypt, and every house where there's blood on the doorpost, everyone is safe. But any home, no matter who lives there, if there's not blood on the doorpost, the firstborn in that house will die. It's called Passover because death passed over the land of Egypt. Can you imagine the fear if the firstborn in every house in Rutherford County died tonight? Can you imagine the absolute terror of what would happen tomorrow night? The grief, the fear, the anxiety. I, I can't imagine it. I, I can't even begin to imagine it. It says they, they literally drove the Hebrews out of the country. They gave them their gold and their silver. Whatever we have to do, we want you gone before the sun sets. Leave. That's why the Passover meal is served with bread that has no yeast in it. There's not time for the bread to rise. I mean, there's a whole meal around it with all the sim symbolism of that last night in slavery and the beginning of a new journey. Well, in Exodus 12, we step into just a part of the instructions. It says, the blood will be a sign for you in the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is a day you're to commemorate for the generations to come. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. And then he gives some instructions on how to celebrate. Did you know God has some opinions about holy days? The instructions to the Hebrew slaves was you're to celebrate this on an ongoing basis as a lasting ordinance. And for thousands of years, the Jewish people have kept Passover. The secular Jews, the religious Jews, Jews in dozens and dozens of countries around the world. In fact, the Jewish people were expelled from the land of Israel. Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD. 60 years later, 130, they rebelled one more time against Rome. And that time, the Romans had enough. They, they wanted to separate Israel and particularly the city of Jerusalem from the Jewish people. So they renamed the city of Jerusalem and scattered the Jews around the empire. The historians say there were so many Jews in the slave markets of Rome that they were almost worthless. And from 130 AD until 1948, the Jewish people did not have a homeland. They were scattered like dust in the wind to the nations of the world. They call it the diaspora, the dispersion. And in 1948, at the end of World War II, when the events of the Holocaust were acknowledged publicly, there was enough international sentiment, and with the support of the United States, the United Nations recognized the modern state of Israel. The awkward truth was Europe did not want the Jews back. The ones that survived the Holocaust, they'd confiscated their property, they'd confiscated their art, they'd emptied their bank accounts, and they didn't want them back. There was no place for them to go. And the modern nation of Israel was born. And an immigration began. 
And the Jewish people came from more than 100 nations. Now, they've been dispersed for 2,000 years. Imagine that, the, the, the process of assimilation over two millennia, and it was two millennia of consistent hatred. The anti-Semitism we see today when knuckleheads are protesting on behalf of Hamas, the murderous terrorist that invaded Israel on October the 7th, that same hatred of the Jews has persisted all through those centuries in all the nations of the world. Yet when there was a state of Israel for them to return to, here they came. They spoke dozens and dozens of languages, but they showed up with their Passover sets. They'd been celebrating Passover in all the nations of the world. The Jewish community says that they may have kept the Sabbath, but it was the Sabbath that kept them. And so that notion that God gave to Moses to give to the people way back in the day in Egypt that you will keep the Passover on a regular basis proved to be a very significant part of their lives. It wasn't just that festival. There's actually three feasts that God directed the people to keep on an annual basis. They're called pilgrimage feasts because the people were directed to go to Jerusalem. When they lived in the land of Israel, they were supposed to go to the city of Jerusalem three times a year. Passover, you know about when the spirit of death passed, over, passed through Egypt. The second pilgrimage feast is Pentecost, 50 days after Passover. Sometime in Hebrew, it's Shavuot, or the Feast of Weeks. It's commemorating the giving of the Ten Commandments on Sinai and a celebration of the wheat harvest in the spring. And then there's a pilgrimage festival in the fall, Sukkot, or the Feast of Tabernacles. Remembering, reminding them of when they dwelt in temporary structures when they were moving from Egypt towards the Promised Land. Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, they are ordered to celebrate with joy. It's a happy holiday. God commanded them, you be happy. <laughs> Makes me smile. Deuteronomy 16 says, three times a year, all your men must appear before the Lord your God at the place he will choose for the Feast of Unleavened Bread. They began celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles before Jerusalem was their capital. Ultimately, it'll be centered in the city of Jerusalem. We can talk more about that another time, but again, initially God said, I'll, I'll tell you where to celebrate, but three times a year, you've got to disrupt your lives and make a journey. And typically, it's about a week-long effort. So they're going to spend three weeks a year in the observance of holy days with some very specific instructions. And they will do that in, in a, one way or another until today. So this notion of holidays and holy days being separate is really a destructive component on our faith. Even Jesus practiced these. I brought you a New Testament example because some of you prefer that. Not sure why. You know the New Testament makes no sense without the Old Testament? It's like a nonsense book without the Old Testament. But in Luke chapter 2, it tells us about Jesus. Every year, his parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. When Jesus was 12 years old, when a, when a Jewish boy is 12 years old, he's old enough for bar mitzvah to take his place as a man amongst the community. And so Jesus travels with his parents to Jerusalem. They went up to the feast according to the custom, and after the feast was over, while his parents were turning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. No doubt the community from Nazareth traveled together. It was safer. It was more efficient. A lot of advantages to that. And, and like most families with 12-year-olds, the 12-year-olds are together, and they begin their journey home, and they assume that Jesus is with his friends until they're a day or so out of town, and they can't find him. And then there's that wonderful moment where Mary says, Joseph, where is your son? And he says, well, if you'll remember the specifics, Mary, that'd be your boy. <laughs> Can you imagine having to say the prayer and acknowledge to God you left his boy at the mall? <laughs> so back to Jerusalem, they go to find Jesus, and he's in the temple talking to the priest who are amazed at his knowledge of Scripture. 
so that even Jesus was honoring these feasts. Now, we're not Jewish, and Jesus was the end of the law, the Scripture tells us, as a means of righteousness. It's not the end of God's ideas. It's just that the law is no longer our means of achieving righteousness. And we have some, uh, the, the completion of that story, or at least the next components of that story, in the birth of Jesus, the incarnation, the arrival of Messiah, and then with his redemptive work, his crucifixion, his death, and his resurrection. And so we have added some holy days to the calendar in Christmas and Easter. And I would submit to you that they are a very important part of the development of our faith and particularly the sustaining of our faith in that we learn as families and as communities of faith the importance of investing time and energy in celebrating Christmas and Easter as holy days, far more than holidays. I'm not opposed to your figgy pudding and your favorite tree decorations. I'm not confused about the meaning of the holy day. But the message that we want to highlight and the effort that we want to extend needs to reflect the significance of that. And to too great of an extent, we have set that aside. We have our own internal complaints about the holy days. And then we have antagonists that pile on. And to be candid, I think we've been so busy complaining that our antagonists have been working to minimize the holidays. Now we're told Merry Christmas is offensive. How did that happen? They have holidays to celebrate the, the most unbelievable degradation and perversion. And they don't want us to say Merry Christmas. They may not want us to. They'll talk about the separation of the church and the state. You understand that that is an obnoxious notion because the the state is very much involved in dictating moral codes and behaviors. Please don't fall prey to that. Don't say that. Don't submit to that. Don't yield to that. The state separate from the conscience of the church will become an increasingly authoritarian state. They will consume your liberties and freedoms. Don't cooperate. They have pronoun patrols now. Nonsense. It's unfortunate that too frequently spring break elicits a greater effort and more anticipation amongst our families than does the celebration of Easter. That is very unfortunate. I'm not opposed to breaks or the beach or holidays. All of those things are fine. But all of those things should be understood in the context of our lives and the value sets that we're teaching that they're secondary to the privilege of remembering what God has done for us on an ongoing basis. It's not a one-time experience. We're watching, we're witnesses to the true paganizations of holidays. One of the, the most, the holidays where the budget is the greatest these days is Halloween. In 23, more than $12 billion, and that's not on candy anymore, folks. Halloween has become an, a holiday for adults to act like pagans. The complaints amongst the Christians are tiresome. The day on which the holiday is celebrated is not the day of the actual event. No kidding. (laughs) Really? Thank you, Obi-Wan. We didn't notice. You know, it does not take great genius to be a critic. In fact, you can be barely conscious and be a critic. I, I think it takes great determination and perseverance to be a person who wants to make something better. And I'm wearied with some of these complaints that there were pagan rituals at the similar times in which we celebrate our Christian holy days. No kidding. No kidding. That has has no diminished impact whatsoever on the reason I'm celebrating. I'm sure there's people doing some immoral things in Middle Tennessee tonight. We chose to come to church. Doesn't diminish our presentation before the Lord tonight. Some of the arguments for not acknowledging God in a public way, a concerted way, teaching the joyful response to what God has done on our behalf are absurd. It's too secular, too commercial, only if you let it be. We don't celebrate correctly. I like that one. 
as if they have an absolute revelation of correct. <laughs> My tree with lights on it offends them. I'm not worshiping a tree. Not even remotely. I'm not confused. I don't celebrate the birth of Jesus because of a fat guy in a red suit. Any more than I celebrate Easter because I like chocolate. I like chocolate before Easter and I like chocolate after Easter. <laughs> But our holy days present us an opportunity to pause, to remember, to be grateful, to not forget, to not lose sight. It's a generational learning point, the importance of our faith, the value attached to God's provision for us. Our place in the world is defined by our faith, not by where we vacation or the address of our home or the school we attend. How is it we have more pride in those things than we have in the fact that we belong to Jesus? It's poor stewardship of our faith for the generations who follow us. When they tell me the young people don't love the Lord, I'm not agitated with the young people. I want to talk to the parents. What have you been doing? We've got to learn the difference between sacred and secular. The best things in your life come from the sacred. And if we don't believe that, you can't give it to your children. So if you've been bluffing your way through, spend some time on your knees before you go to sleep and say, God, I've been a fraud. I've sat in church, but the aspirations of my life have had nothing to do with you. I've wanted more money or more leisure or a finer home or a better car, whatever you've been pursuing. It's okay. Tell the Lord the truth. Say, God, help me. I'd like to leave a better legacy than that. He will. And then I think the institutional effort around our holy days is far more significant than we have been living out for our churches, for our Christian universities, for our Christian schools. They're not just about holidays and breaks from our routine. It's how can we take our collective effort and resources and attention and say to the world, this is the most important day in our calendar. We can't make greater efforts around Super Bowl weekend or Final Four weekend or whatever your holiday of choice is than we make around the holy days in our calendar. That's absurd and faithless. They deserve our best efforts, the most significant celebrations of our year. The collective efforts among the people of faith to mobilize the community in a unity of purpose, a distinctiveness of the people of faith. Yes, we gather on this day. Yes, we make an extraordinary effort. Yes, we do that because God has changed our lives. Let us tell you the story. So I think Easter matters. God is moving amidst our community. When God is moving, it's a learning season. We don't just get to do things the same way and rinse and repeat. When God is moving, it requires an awareness on our part. We have to, it's a listening season. Folks, I, I, at no time in my life has it been more important to listen to what's happening in our world than it is right now. If you're allowing secular messaging to define how you believe and what you think, about circumstances, events, and people, you are suffering from delusion because the messaging is deceptive. And we've been warned about it multiple times. The greatest warnings when Jesus talked about the end of the age was against deception. We have to have the humility to live in a transformational season. And I'm preaching to the choir because you all are living this out. But humility is not something you acquire directly. It comes to us indirectly. And I gave you a list of some things that facilitate humility, serving other people, being thoughtful of others, making sacrificial choices. See, all of these work against selfishness. It's hard to serve others if it, what's good for me is your first choice. It's hard to be thoughtful of others or sacrificial towards other people. To be generous with your time and your attention, your effort, your thought, with your listening, to be patient with other people. That is not easy. Why can't they do the right thing? Why aren't they paying any? How are they, who taught them to drive? They get their driver's license online. online. <laughs> don't they know what I want? Why aren't they responding to me? I don't like this. Blah, 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 blah. Stop it. <laughs> Kindness. Failure contributes to humility. And when it comes to the topic of humility, you have a choice. You can humble yourself before the Lord, or you can be humiliated. 
And I put failure in my list because it, it seems to me that in my life, when things haven't gone the way I wanted them to go, I have to make a choice if I'll pretend that I didn't notice and deny that there was a failure, just kind of muddle forward. Or I say, you know, I didn't work right. I didn't understand. I, I didn't respond correctly. But I'm not going to give in. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to stop. And you stand up again and you try again. In my heart and in my imagination, I have the image of a little person learning to walk. There's something, you know, they'll pull up and then they like wobble like they're inebriated. And by then, you know, everybody's got their phones out and they're taking pictures. They're going to be an Olympic athlete. Did you see that? You know, and they're all... And they pick up a foot and they collapse. And they pull back up. And they work their way through that until they're so mobile they wear the rest of us out chasing them. I used to love to watch the newborn folds in the field in the springtime. When they're born from the knee down, they're the same length they're going to be when they're grown. So they got more leg than they know what to do with. But, but they can't nurse unless they can stand up. So they got this internal drive to get up. And their legs are weak and they haven't used their muscles. And you watch them try to push up and they'll collapse a couple times, which just always seemed funny to me. I know, pray. <laughs> then they finally get up and they're standing there weaving on all four legs like the wind's blowing them around. They were drinking with the toddlers. <laughs> and inevitably they'll pick up one of those feet to move and down they'll go again. But they get back up, and in just a few days, they're running across the pastures. Now, their brakes don't work, <laughs> which makes it really funny. They'll run into one another. They'll run into the fence. If your dad's a vet, that's good for business. You love that. Do that more. <laughs> failure. Don't let your failures keep you from getting up and trying again. I gave you a whole list of scriptures around humility. I'm not going to read them to you. You can do that for your devotional. But we're gathering this weekend to present ourselves to the Lord, to say we have not forgotten. You reached out to us with your son. And Lord Jesus, you offered yourself on our behalf. And it's changed everything about our lives for time and eternity. And we will celebrate that with complete enthusiasm. We'll put up a hot air balloon and we'll give the kids some candy and We'll have a concert after we're done telling people the gospel. Because it's not just a preaching session. It's a community celebrating the fact that we believe there is a God. Amen. And to tell the story of what he's done for us. And in this season, it's that he was willing to take the punishment that I deserved for all of my brokenness. <clears throat> that I might have all the blessings he's due for his obedience. So we want to pray for you. We want to ask God's anointing on your life. If you'll allow us, we're going to use a little oil. Throughout the scripture, oil is used as a type, a representation of the Holy Spirit. And what we all want to understand is whatever our, if you're parking cars this week and you're doing under the authority of the Holy Spirit, Amen. whatever your assignment may be. So we want to anoint you. We, we can't pray a lengthy prayer for you as individuals or we'd be here at breakfast. But we want to anoint everybody, and then we'll have a corporate prayer. So there's some people coming to, to help me anoint folks. If, if, you're, if you've got that assignment and you know it, if you'll take your place. If they can see you, they're going to be able to imagine where they're headed. I want to say a little prayer while they're getting in place, and then I'll give you some more instructions. Can we do that? Lord, thank you. Thank you for these men and women. And Lord, we present ourselves to you tonight. Lord, in all of our weakness, in all of our shortcomings, you have chosen us. And we present ourselves now as living sacrifices. And we ask for your help. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if everybody will stand with me. There is, at the front of the room, some folks. There is, at the aisle in the middle, some folks. And at the back of the room, are there some people? So which, if, if you're in the back half on the floor, it's probably quicker for you to go backwards. If you're in the front, you can come forward. If you're in the theater seats, stadium seats at the back, you can go top or bottom, depending on which is simpler for you. You be anointed, and then we're going to have a prayer, and we will go forth in the name of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Here we go.
Hey everyone, thank you so much for sticking around. Rachel and I are so excited to have a little more time with you. You know, we did something new this year around Easter. You know, it, it takes hundreds of us here on campus to make any weekend service happen. So then when we have an Easter service, we need even more. But we wanted to be intentional in extending a way for you to be able to volunteer and be a part of the Easter um, service team here yes. at the church. And so one of the ways that we, really the way that we did it, it's the first year that I've been able to be a part of this, was we created an online Easter prayer team. Many of you have been a part of this. Thank you so much for being a part. But you know, we've taken the last three weeks to do a couple different things. Um, it, this is all email based. So I, I sent out an email the first week praying for each and every one of you. Thank you so much for Thank being a you. part. Then we had the second email that went out. We prayed specifically over our campus and our physical components. There's so much from the, the technology to the weather to the hot air balloons, so much taking place. We need God's presence. Amen. And then last week, our email was about praying for the children. You know, I, <laughs> Pastor had the kids up on stage. It, children matter to God and they matter to us. They deserve our best. And now this week, we're gonna be sending out an email praying for the people. Church is a people initiative. We need one another. You are the church. We are Amen. the church. It's not yes. a building. You know, Pastor says it's not tucked in a closet somewhere. And so, Rachel, I would love it if you would take a moment and just pray with our online audience for, for our Easter weekend, or really just for the Easter weekend for churches everywhere in our nation and across the world. Absolutely. I want you guys to join me in prayer over this. So, mm. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity for us to gather and to be in community with one another. Thank you for the people who are going to be here on campus who are going to be joining our online community as well. Lord, we pray that you will bless each and every one of them. Lord, we pray for protection over all of them to those who are traveling with through playing, Lord, or driving to campus. We pray that your angels will be around them, Lord, that, you're, that you will protect them coming to campus and leaving campus as they return home. And Lord, we pray that you will set your angels around us at every entrance into campus, Amen. Lord, that they will protect us from anyone who wishes to cause harm. Lord, we pray that you will stop them dead in their tracks. Mm. And Lord, we just pray over every child who's going to be here on campus that yes. your word will touch them, that they will know the love that you have for them, Lord, <laughs> that they will have an understanding of who you are and that you want to have a relationship with them, that they are special and created in your image. Mm. Lord, we thank you so much for that, Lord. We pray over every campus, every church campus Amen. across the nation, not yes. just here, Lord. We pray your protection over all of them, that when people come and they attend church, that they will be greeted and feel so welcomed and that they will be impacted by the truth of your word and the words that the pastors and the people around them are gonna share with them, Lord, that they will come to know you as their personal savior and seek after you every single day of their life and not just in a church service. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. Amen, wow, that was powerful. Powerful. Thank you, Rachel. Of course. And guys, you know, Pastor Allen here on staff, we're, we're doing an anointing of our volunteers. And so I want to pray a prayer of anointing over each and every one of you really quick. And there's a verse I want to share with you. It's 2 Corinthians 1, 22 through 23. And it says, he anoints us. He sets his seal of ownership on us and puts his spirit in our hearts. Amen. So once again, please allow me to pray for you. Almighty God, Send your anointing upon our lives. Yes, Lord. May the words of our mouths, the thoughts of our minds, the meditations of our hearts, and the activity of our lives be pleasing in your sight. Open our eyes to see with your perspective. Grant us a willing spirit that we would not rebel against your invitations. Holy Spirit, direct our path towards wisdom and life. We choose to live for the glory of God, to give praise to the creator of all things, and to rejoice in the majesty of the holy God. Let everything that has breath Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you, guys. God bless you. See you this weekend.